Thanks, Mikolai, for the, the kind introduction. I think, you know, this seminar series has been a great success uh, so far. So I think in, in terms of the entire community, we're, we're grateful that you have been organizing it. And, and personally, I'm super excited to speak today. Um, as you just have mentioned, um, you know, these are my conflict of interest that uh, you can read. Um, and I want to, as some of you might know, or as you just have introduced, you know, for me, virtually, albeit returning to the Dana-Farber is also returning uh, really to the site where my uh, affinity and affection for targeted protein degradation has started. Um, and putting the slides together, I also realized that really a lot of our scientific curiosity and scientific interests today still relate back to, uh, you know, the, the time uh, that I spent in, in Jay's lab. Um, and so what I'm speaking of today is also to some degree, uh, really the concerted effort of this fantastic group of people. And I particularly want to highlight two uh, members of the lab, which is uh, Dennis Buckley, who was really my, my partner in crime uh, as a chemist through this first couple of ventures in, in the targeted protein degradation space. And then of course, Jay himself for being a, a fantastic uh, and inspirational mentor uh, throughout these times and, and um, until today. And the two questions that really kept me busy since then are, are listed here. Um, the first one being, how are gene regulatory circuits rewired in cancer? And the second one being, how can we or can we uh, devise pharmacological solutions to better understand, to probe, map, and eventually disrupt these uh, aberrant gene controls, uh, gene control circuits in cancer? Um, Jumping ahead uh, five years uh, until today, uh, these are still the questions that my lab uh, tries to address. Uh, so we're still interested in using chemical biology uh, as a means to uh, understand uh, gene control mechanisms at the high kinetic resolution. Uh, in particular, we're interested in, in the application of, of uh, uh, chemical tools because they uh, allow us a higher kinetic resolution in the study of protein function. So whereas Typically, genetic perturbations, your shRNA or your CRISPR knockout, take quite a while to manifest in the phenotypes. You have a re relatively gradual response. Uh, chemical perturbance speed that either uh, uh, affect protein activity or, in our case, mostly affect protein abundance, tend to happen on a much shorter time scale. Uh, and we're strong believers that when we couple these acute perturbations with uh, fast readouts that uh, are kinetically matched to the time of perturbations, uh, we can really uh, go, go much closer to uh, a first order uh, bio biological mechanism uh, and to understanding causality, uh, in our case, particularly in gene control. The second big pillar uh, of research in my lab is to try to advance targeted protein degradation to fundamentally be uh, enabled to go after these uh, undruggable cancer vulnerabilities. Uh, again, of course, as you can imagine, uh, our most favorite undruggable vulnerabilities have to do with uh, transcription and gene control. Um, and as I'll show you during the course of this presentation, our core focus here has been uh, kind of evolving from protex uh, towards a molecular glues over the last uh, three or four years. Uh, to fulfill these two, two goals, uh, the lab is organized in a relatively multidisciplinary manner, giving home to people that have a core focus in, in cell and molecular biology, but also folks interested in computation biology, uh, down to, not down to, up to uh, chemists. Uh, and so a, a core topic that uh, you'll find as a kind of a uh, continuing narrative through this, this uh, presentation is also our quest in trying to understand using targeted protein degradation to understand which channel transcriptional co-activators could be actionable targets for cancer therapy. Uh, and you'll hear me talk about uh, most of these uh, protein components uh, highlighted here. So on a very conceptual level, uh, of course, as most of you can imagine that interface between transcription and gene control and chemical biology is a particularly challenging one. Uh, and I think it's particularly challenging for the reason that we're mostly still thinking in these dogmatic views of the druggable and undruggable proteome, where we consider proteins uh, that have a hydrophobic pocket and encodes for some sort of biochemical activity, <clears throat> typically as druggable proteins, uh, and where we, uh, uh, on, on contrast, uh, put every other protein that does not fit that bill into this undruggable uh, bucket. And, and as most of you know, uh, the vast majority of all transcription factors and gene control factors would fall into that category. Uh, letting us argue that 
uh, we really need to consider a new type of pharmacology that leaves that uh, dogmatic space of finding for antagonists or agonists towards uh, trying to find molecules that act as modulators, that act as chemical neomorphs, uh, uh, eventually endowing proteins with a new functionality, typically by installing or prompting protein-protein uh, uh, interactions. And if you think in that framework, uh, I think it becomes fairly obvious that targeted protein degradation is one embodiment of this uh, idea of neo neomorphic pharmacology. Um, in its first iteration, at least from my perspective, first iteration, um, targeted protein degradation still relies on these heterobifunctional degraders or protex that probably won't be news to anyone on this, on this call, but I'm still gonna introduce them uh, for protocol reasons. Uh, so these are uh, heterobifunctional molecules that have two binding elements that they use to simultaneously bind to a component of a culinary ring ligase or a E3 ligase, more generally speaking, uh, and a protein of interest. And this dual binding event then consequently uh, induces proximity between these components, enabling ubiquitin transfer uh, and targeted protein uh, degradation. And there's a lot to like about Protex. There's a, they have a, it's relatively straightforward to change the direction of this neomorphic activity uh, by just uh, exchanging the warhead binding to the protein of interest. Uh, they have catalytic turnover, as most of you have heard, uh, and as also uh, people that have followed that series are uh, perfectly aware of there's a clinical investigation going on for this modality. Um, as Mikola has uh, uh, told you in the introduction, our first um, uh, interaction with the heterobifunctional functional degraders was really when uh, we managed to de degrade uh, BAD4 and the BAD family proteins. Um, and uh, we very early on realized that degrading BAD4 and the BAD uh, has a strong efficacy in several models as compared to uh, competitive inhibition uh, by uh, the JK1 antagonist. Uh, we have seen this in disseminated mouse models of AML. Uh, we have seen this in also different PDX models, uh, in this case, TLL. Um, and since then, colleagues in the field have really uh, further capitalized on that. Uh, here's two uh, studies from uh, Xiaoming Wang's lab describing two highly potent degraders that are acting in the picomolar range that have improved PKPD properties that are now capable of uh, inducing full tumor regression at only five mix per kg at intermediate dosing. Um, when we, however, looked at the really the molecular consequences of bad inhibition as opposed to bad degradation, uh, we made the interesting observation that when you inhibit uh, BAD4 with this uh, small molecule uh, antagonist, JQ1, we see a relatively focal transcriptional response, meaning that we have around a thousand genes that are, uh, that are predominantly affected. The same experiment, same time point with even 10 times lower concentrations of bad degrader, we see that we have a global disruption of mRNA production. So the vast majority of all mRNAs that we can detect uh, is also downregulated. Uh, and we did a mechanistic follow-up that uh, basically showed that this is uh, the, the mechanism of a, of a uh, disrupted uh, transcriptional checkpoint that is called transcription elongation. Um, and I think when we looked at that, uh, we were also a bit suspicious uh, as, it to, as it pertains to the therapeutic window that you can achieve with uh, bad degradation. And so I think it's also fair to speculate uh, how much of the very impressive therapeutic window that we see in many of these uh, in vivo studies comes from an, a, a true cancer specific therapeutic window uh, as opposed to a species, uh, species dependent uh, degradation differences. In our purpose, however, what for our purposes, what we were most interested in is whether what we see here is a universal truth. So would degradation of, of uh, co-activators or transcription, general transcription factors always prompt such a pronounced transcriptional response. Uh, and this was a question that uh, one of the first two students that joined my lab, Martin Jaeger, uh, wanted to take. And, and he got fascinated by uh, a, a co-activator complex called the mediator complex here, sitting right next to, uh, to BAD4 in this, in this cartoon. Um, so what mediator is, it's a, it's a 30 subunit molecular machine uh, whose role is really to communicate the information that is stored in DNA-bound transcription factors to RNA polymerase too. Um, and so what Martin wanted to know is whether there's a therapeutic rationale of, of targeting core mediator subunits. He wanted to know whether all genes similarly, similarly depend on mediator, uh, and then some nitty-gritty transcriptional uh, uh, questions such as uh, which transcriptional checkpoints are regulated by that complex. 
Um, so to understand Mediator better, he uh, exactly employed this, uh, this approach of, of targeted protein degradation, uh, particularly via the, the DTAG or degradation tag system that uh, many of you will be aware of, uh, where we knock in uh, a tag in endogenous in the, in the genome, which then gives us pharmacological control over uh, targeted protein abundance. Uh, so he developed this, uh, this uh, platform of isogenic cell lines in, where in each cell we have uh, control over different mediator subunits and we can degrade these subunits after one to six hours of uh, ligand exposure. And so the first experiment that we did is where we wanted to understand how the transcription response, the transcription fingerprint of mediator disruption would relate to degrading BD4 in the beds. Uh, and we did a shallow RNA sequencing experiment that here should just show you that these two are fundamentally very different. Where when we degrade BD4, we again here can recapitulate that we basically see all transcript levels go down. That was really not the case when we degrade any of these different mediator subunits, where typically what we have observed was a much more narrow, much more focal transcription response. One observation that we made that was that the strongest transcription phenotype that, that we have observed was when we degraded uh, this core component called MET14, which is really the structural backbone uh, that holds the entire complex together. Something that uh, from a structural perspective was really not that surprising. What was very interesting for us was then to really go deep into this transcriptomics profiling. And so here we, we left, what we did before was just a shallow mRNA sequencing six hours after ligand exposure. And here we wanted to be faster on both the perturbation and the readout. Uh, so we degraded mediator uh, only for, in this case, MET14, only for one hour, and we paired it with uh, a nascent RNA sequencing me method uh, called transient transcriptome sequencing. Uh, and this and the uh, ensuing uh, figures are all of a collaboration with uh, Patrick Kramer's lab in, in Göttingen. And, and what was particularly exciting for us to see here is that uh, many genes, and I'll show that on a more holistic level on the next plot, are not affected at all when you degrade uh, MET14. However, there is a subset of lineage specifying transcription factors such as MIC and MIP, also known for their uh, very well documented uh, role in oncogenesis, where one hour after MET14 degradation, there's arguably no transcriptional activity measurable whatsoever. Um, and that was something intriguing to us. Um, this is just the proof that this is also true uh, on a, on a genome-wide uh, level where really the average uh, loss of, uh, of transcription on, on a, your average Joe gene uh, is really uh, uh, negligible. Uh, we then wanted to understand the mechanism behind that. Um, and we did that by uh, basically developing a kinetic model as to how mediator degradation affects uh, the, the transcription of uh, individual genes. Um, and we did that by coupling these transient transcriptome sequencing with another approach that is called PROSIG, where we don't measure uh, we don't measure mRNA synthesis, but we measure where RNA pole 2 uh, sits on the genome. Um, and this is a not very trivial plot, so I'm going to try to, uh, in the interest of time, cut it down to the essentials. What that plot tells you is that every, every gene is represented by a dot, and it's basically segregated based on two kinetic parameters. Pause duration, this is when polymerase initiates at a gene, there's a regulatory, a regulated uh, step that is called pause release, uh, where it basically then the polymerase waits and hangs out until it gets a regulatory signal that then licenses it uh, to uh, continue the transcription. And then productive initiation. This is a measurement of how often polymerase has really run through uh, this pausing site in a productive manner, how often an initiation went uh, was productive. And what we have observed is that all the genes that are highly sensitive to mediator degradation are kinetically very optimized. That means polymerase is going, is running through it very quickly and polymerase does basically not stop at this one regulatory uh, checkpoint. Uh, what happens when we now degrade mediator is the transcription at those highly kinetically highly optimized genes collapses. There is no buffering mechanism that the cell can come up with. What was interesting to see and what explained the fact that the vast majority of genes were in fact not affected by mediator degradation is that uh, the, we, we identified that there is a buffering capacity and all those genes that basically suffered from a lower initiation could compensate for that by having a more productive um, uh, uh, pause release rate, which means uh, for reasons that were, we could then figure out were related with another 
general transcription uh, coactivator called PTFB. Genes basically knew that there was less initiation and just made that other regulatory step uh, faster. And that explained on a mechanistic level why some genes are hypersensitive to mediator degradation, whilst the most genes were ineffective or are not effective. So if chemists are on the call, you can now relax. That was the last piece of deep uh, transcriptomics uh, data that I'll show. Um, what I wanna basically zoom in here is the fact that based on this uh, transcriptomics profiling, where we see a very focal response on that, that affects very important transcription regulators such as MIG and MIP, I think one could make a, a, an argument that uh, if we would now have a small molecule degrader format 14, it would be probably worth to investigate, particularly for, for its therapeutic potential, particularly if you put it in light to you know, how these bad degraders looked uh, on a transcriptome level. The problem is that MET14 is, is intrinsically an, a, a protein that we call, would call unligandable. So it does not have any pockets where we could fashion small molecules that could, in a protein uh, building uh, design, act as such a, a protein of interest binding uh, component. Uh, and so that brings me a bit to the limitation that I see with in the protein field. Uh, and that is that fundamentally what protex allows is to degrade proteins that we can also bind. And I think that is great for many proteins that are still in the undruggable category. Uh, but I think it also has some limitations, particularly in the field uh, that we care most for, which is the field of gene control. Um, and this is why we over the last couple of year, years have been so excited about uh, molecular glue degraders. Uh, so what is a molecular glue degrader? You would probably find different definitions in, in different papers. So I'm just going to give you mine that is probably very relaxed. To me, this is a small molecule that catalyzes a protein-protein interaction between a protein of interest and an E3 lylase. Uh, typically, this the protein-protein interaction is characterized by highly cooperative binding, which means that you don't need a pocket on or affinity for any or either of the two components. Uh, and that really opens up uh, the, the possibility to degrade proteins that we cannot bind in isolation with small molecules. Uh, the best studied example uh, are, of course, these uh, thalidomide analogs uh, that I represent here as a cartoon. I'll come back to them, but just uh, for now, uh, very briefly, the way how they work is that uh, the thalidomide analogs bind to cerebellum, and that binding event uh, creates a, a composite protein small molecule surface that is then sufficient to recruit uh, different zinc finger transcription factors, uh, again, uh, enabling their ubiquitination and degradation by the proteasome. So I think, you know, there is a lot to like also about these molecular glue degraders. I think the major disadvantage uh, in the field was that they have really been perceived to be a rare exception. And we have no, had no ideas as to how we could discover them in a systematic manner. So I think, you know, from a conceptual perspective, again, there is evidence that molecular glue degraders might be more common than, than we think. We know that several uh, natural products act as molecular glues. Uh, we know that uh, they, they span a quite wide uh, chemical diversity in, in, in terms of their, uh, stru how, how structurally elaborate they are. Uh, we know from uh, important work from Eric Fisher's lab that uh, the protein surfaces that, that can be in, in, involved in these uh, uh, protein um, uh, in the E3 ligase neosubstrate uh, interactions uh, are sometimes highly unconserved, speaking for a true neosubstrate interaction. And we also know uh, that uh, protein surfaces fundamentally seem to have evolved in order not to stick together. Uh, and this is something that is here supported by genetic evidence where uh, in introducing mutations, uh, hydrophobic uh, mutations at key surface residues has led to an oligomerization in 12 out of 12 uh, E. coli proteins, uh, which I think is, is something very fascinating to, to try to conceptually uh, further uh, advance by the, by the fact that uh, fundamentally small molecule binding might introduce similar hydrophobic features uh, that are here introduced by these uh, uh, point mutations. So my optimistic outlook would be that molecular glues might be a molecular glue degraders, might be more common than we think, uh, we just need to find them. So how did we try to find them? Um, we initially set out to really study the genetic determinants of small molecule degraders. Uh, so what that means is we wanted to know the genetic inventory that a cell needs to have 
in order to allow the activity of different degraders to happen. Um, in particular, we were focused on five different degraders um, that uh, degrade either uh, DHL, uh, DK15, or Cerebron, uh, uh, that, or that hijack these ligases to degrade um, uh, essential uh, proteins. And the way how we did this is that we simply ran uh, genome-wide CRISPR screens uh, where we, we knock out every gene in the human genome and then ask the question, does knockout of that gene convey a selective growth advantage against any of these degraders? So we basically functionally assign a meaning between a gene uh, and a small molecule action. Uh, and when we did that, uh, we identified many uh, gene small molecule interactions that were fairly specific to one particular drug. We found some that were shared between uh, some of these degraders, in a, for instance, in a ligase specific manner, uh, but one gene really stood out uh, and that was the gene uh, UB2M. Uh, and before I forget it, uh, that paper and also the work that I'll share over the next slide was really championed by uh, Christina, uh, a former postdoc in the lab who now I'm sure very successfully has already established uh, her own lab at the IRB in Barcelona. Um, so what you, what you see here is, is just one um, evidence that this gene UB2M is, is really conveying resistant to uh, different degraders. So here's the comparison of a cerebellum based degrader and the DHL based degrader and different knockouts that we have identified to be essential. Um, and you see that while some of these other modulators such as members of the COP signalosome or this uh, E3 ligase or, or Kalin uh, ligase exchange factor CAN1, they only appear to be relevant in this context for the cerebellum based degrader, not so relevant for the VHL based degrader. However, UB2M really stands out here, uh, conveying a 10 to 1000 uh, fold resistance uh, to all of these degraders. So, what is UB2M doing? It's an enzyme that is involved in the nedylation of colored ring ligases. So this is a post-translation modification that renders an inactive colored ring ligase uh, into an active ligase. Uh, biochemically, this is something that we can very easily observe because this colored ring uh, backbone, so we have um, seven that are encoded in the human genome. They, we can observe uh, whether they are hypo or unnedylated or hyper or nedylated uh, via two molecular weights. Uh, and you see that typically in an unperturbed cell, you always have a balance between active, aka not, uh, nedylated, and unactive, uh, aka non-nedylated colon backbones. If we introduce these mutations UB2M, you see that this balance is drastically shifted towards the hyponedylated, inactive colon ring backbones. And this is also something that we can revert if we reintroduce uh, UB2M uh, cDNA into these cells. Interesting, when we now combine this, this biochemical evidence with uh, transcriptomic uh, evidence, where we, we basically ask, what is the compendium of Cullen ring ligases uh, that are A, affected? For instance, Cal5 ligases are not affected by that mutation. And then we combine that with what are the substrate receptors that are uh, actively expressed in those cells. We have reason to believe that more than 200 uh, Cullen ring ligases are, um, are uh, affected by that single mutation, this master regulator of culinary ring ligase activity. So again, what we can now do with those cells, here you just see uh, yet another uh, data point where we can show you that indeed when we induce that mutation, we see these strong resistant uh, to bad degraders. Um, and what we hypothesized is, well, when, when we know that this mutation conveys resistance to all non-degraders, maybe we can find new degraders simply by searching for small molecules uh, that would lose their activity uh, in a hyponedylated background. And this is exactly what we did uh, in a very simple experiment where we just screened for differential cell viability. And we only tested 2000 uh, molecules that we knew had uh, some cytotoxic activity in our cells. So we here use this near haploid uh, KVM7, it's a, it's a leukemia cell line. Um, and and we basically we basically searching for molecules that would kill white type cells and that were incapable of killing the UB2M isogenic counterparts leaving us with a, an, a small number of, of hits that, that fulfilled that criteria, all of which validated uh, in those ranging experiments. Uh, and so it was then, of course, a very fun exercise to try to assign uh, meaning to these, um, to these different data points. Uh, and so one of the molecules that creatively we hear named DSM1, uh, we had a relatively easy time because this is a structure that is A, not very pretty, uh, and B, has this aerosophonomide feature. Uh, and we had an easy time uh, because there is this fantastic paper from Deepak Nichawan's lab uh, that came out in 2017 that has 
uh, elucidated that a certain set of these aerosol phonomides, uh, they did most of the work on, on disolam, in, in fact, acts as a molecular glue. Uh, binding at the interface between the E3 ligase DK15 and the splicing factor RBM39, inducing RBM39 degradation. So we hypothesized that maybe our molecule here basically is a new chemistry that recapitulates an old uh, glue degrader trick, which would also kind of nicely validate our approach. Um, so we just validated it, um, starting with a, a focus CRISPR screen. Uh, so what you see here, every uh, this is a, a library that is focusing on all culin ring ligases and all known uh, regulators thereof. Uh, and in fact, uh, the more to the left, your, the more to the right your dot is, the stronger uh, uh, the resistance phenotype uh, we have observed. Uh, and indeed, DK15 was the strongest hit in this, uh, in this focus CRISPR screens uh, when we basically were assaying for genes that upon knockout would uh, convey resistance to DSM1. We could then validate that in a clean DK15 knockout cell line compound uses activity. Uh, we could also show that our molecule, similar to indisolum, induces the degradation of RBM39, and it does so uh, in a DK15 dependent manner. So when we knock out DK15, no degradation is observed. Uh, we also did expression proteomics and could see that degradation of RBM39 uh, appeared relatively selective, particularly compared to RBM23, a protein that is often also degraded by these aerosol phonomides. Of course, we were more interested in associating meaning to uh, molecules where we didn't have any prior knowledge as to how they would be working. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you how we did that for these molecules here, DSM two, three, and four. Uh, so just conceptually, uh, we were at the stage where we had hypothesized that we are hijacking uh, culin ring ligase. We didn't know what ligase. Um, and we hypothesized that if we're degrading something, it is probably a protein that is, a set, or that is a, a, an essential protein. Um, and so we kind of had a different uh, area of assays that we put together in order to put meaning uh, to, this, uh, to this, at this point, relatively um, a clean cartoon. So the first experiment that we did uh, was uh, geared to try to understand what are the proteins that we're degrading. Here, this is relatively simple uh, because we just did expression proteomics, um, trying where we can measure the abundance of around uh, seven to 8,000 proteins five hours after drug treatment. And what was interesting to see here is that the strongest degraded protein is, a, is a, in all of these three cases is cyclin K. Uh, this is a regulatory cyclin that teams up with these two transcriptional kinases, CDK12 and CDK13. Again, kinase is involved in transcription elongation. Uh, we could validate that all of our molecules prompt the strong degradation of cyclin K within uh, one to two hours uh, in single digit micromolar uh, concentrations. We did a couple of uh, typical control experiments uh, where we could show that indeed the degradation of, the, uh, of cyclin K, in this case via DSM2, is dependent on the proteasomes, dependent on active nodulation cascade. Uh, but here, the most interesting experiment is that we could also rescue the degradation of cyclin K by DSM2 when we co-treated cells with uh, a covalent inhibitor of CDK1213, uh, insinuating that in order for our molecules to degrade cyclin K, they need to bind to the active side of the associated uh, kinase uh, CDK12 and CDK13. Uh, teaming up with Matthias Geyer, we could also show that our molecules very weakly, but nevertheless bind to and inhibit the catalytic activity of 12 and 13. Um, again, reverting to transcriptomics, we could show that uh, cyclin K degradation uh, is on the, on the transcriptomic level, very similar uh, to CDK1213 inhibition. Um, so you see that both uh, uh, DSM2, 3, and 4 all share relatively similar transcriptome, also here by a gene set enrichment analysis. DSM1, the RBM39 degrader, of course, was a completely different uh, transcriptome. What was also interesting to see is when we profile these molecules uh, in, in a Kano beats assay, is that they basically come back uh, cleanly, uh, meaning that there is only one or two kinases that we, we could measure that they will bind to in these cell-based assays, arguing that really the affinity to the kinase is very, very weak, and that the, the pharmacology that we have, or the molecular pharmacology, or the phenotypes that we have observed, really are tied to the degradation of cyclin K. So at this point, we knew what we're degrading, but we did not know how we're degrading it. 
So again, we turned uh, to our Kalinwing ligase focused uh, screens. Uh, here with an inducible Cas9 system that also allowed us to really uh, capture some of these very essential genes. And what we have seen here was almost, almost beautiful uh, because we have seen a near complete culinary ligase complex with a culin backbone and adapter. We see most of these associated proteins, but we did not find our substrate receptor. We did not find our Cerebron, our DK15 or our VHL. Um, at that point, leading us to believe that maybe our molecules are somehow hijacking an orphan subset receptor that just lacks annotation. We did the entire experiment again, just doing a genome-wide screen here uh, for the purpose of finding exactly the same genes again. Uh, so at that point, we concluded that these CRISPR screens, uh, uh, CRISPR-based loss of function screens, really failed to identify a dedicated subset receptor. Luckily, we had another uh, trick up our sleeves. Uh, where we, we took wild type cells um, and exposed them to very high concentration of um, our degraders, uh, allowing for clonal outgrowth. And we then uh, isolated cells that were resistant to our small molecules and performed a targeted resequencing for many of the genes that we found in the CRISPR screen to be essential. Um, and the idea was here to hopefully find point mutations that would inform on uh, direct ligand binding. And that was a very interesting experiment because what we have observed is that the vast majority of all point mutations that we could uh, identify were all in DDB1, all in that adapter protein, particularly clustering at the PPC domain, which is interestingly also uh, a domain that has been shown to be uh, hijacked by viral proteins to redirect the activity of these uh, CAL4 backbones uh, to, uh, to degrade host factors. So we hypothesized from that, maybe our molecules, our small molecules, basically to recapitulate this, the, the, the mechanism of these viral proteins, redirecting the activity of that imperfect or incomplete culinary ring ligase complex by directly uh, uh, kind of diverting the activity of the uh, adapter protein. Um, so that would be the model where the small molecule we know needs to bind to CDK12 and somehow needs to induce proximity uh, between CDK12 cycling K and that DDB1 uh, adapter protein. In order to really prove uh, that hypothesis, uh, we teamed up with Nico Thomas' lab, um, and particularly Susanna, a very talented PhD student that had established this uh, elegant tier thread assay that allows in a fully recombinant setup to now ask the question whether titration of our molecule really induces the proximity between CDK12 cycling K and DDB1. And the answer was that it does so. Uh, what was also interesting to see is that there appears to be some sort of baseline activity between CDK12 and DDB1, and that our uh, molecules just very, very strongly stabilize uh, that weak interaction. So as kind of a conclusion, um, I hope I could show you that uh, this chemical profiling in hyponatilated cells uh, is a strategy to find novel glue degraders. Um, I, I hope I, I can also convince you that this is a uh, non-obvious mechanism of action. So I think if I would have been tasked to devise a strategy to degrade cycling K, that would not have been what I would have charted on a whiteboard. Um, what makes it particularly unique is really in that case that CDK12 almost um, takes on the responsibility of a substrate receptor. And uh, we are excited about that approach because we believe we can apply it much broadly, uh, much more broadly than we have uh, executed here, where we just did a, a small viability screen with uh, 2000 molecules. And we're now actively uh, going after different phenotypes and, and also pathway-centric reporters. Of course, I wanna mention that gluing CDK12 cycling K to this DDB1 interface uh, appears to be an emerging uh, mechanism of action uh, where uh, there's two other papers uh, that stand out, uh, particularly this study from uh, Ben Eberts and, and Nico Thomas lab with uh, Mikula and Susanna, uh, and also another paper from, from Ting Han's lab. And I think what is particularly here is that all these studies started from different starting points. They found different chemistry, but in the end, all of that chemistry converges on apparently a very same, uh, the very same, if not, uh, or, or at least a similar uh, molecular mechanism of action. Um, and um, so I think that the two points that I want to make here is A, doing cellular screens is really interesting if your goal is to find novel glue mechanism of action. Uh, and you need to pair it with a very uh, detailed target identification campaign consisting of uh, omics approaches, 
but I think it also has become very clear that biochemistry and if possible structural elucidation really then makes you understand the, this, the particular pharmacology that you're observing. And the second point is that it's obvious that there's different chemical or different small molecule scaffolds that can functionally converge on the same, on the stabilization of the same protein-protein interface. Uh, and I think really elucidating how that can work on a molecular level uh, will be something very intriguing. So I've told you now about this approach, uh, this profiling in hyponatilated cells, where again, as a recap, we can basically query 200 ligase at, at the same time that the type of neosubstrate that we're fishing out is always fundamentally tied to um, the screen that we're running. So in our case of a viability, differential viability screen, we will find neosubstrate that, that are affected or that are involved in maintaining cellular fitness of that particular cell line. Uh, in our case, we ran chemistry, from a chemistry perspective, we were completely unbiased. Um, to close my presentation, I wanna uh, give a, a quick uh, preview on, on another project that we're working on, uh, where the, the setup is different, where we really want to dive deeper on, on novel small molecules that uh, are seroplon specific, so that redirect the function of, of seroplon, where we already know what is the pond of new substrates that we're fishing in, um, and where because of that, we also start from a bespoke uh, sm smaller uh, chemical library that we're profiling. So in order to introduce that, uh, I wanna again, probably not anything new for anyone on the call, but again, to fulfill protocol, I'm gonna introduce you to the, uh, I think, sim still you know, fascinating molecular pharmacology of thalidomide and its analogs that were introduced in, in post-war Germany uh, and, and caused the, the birth defects of, I think, 10,000 or more kids. Uh, and that were later then repurposed for its um, antineoplastic uh, activity in certain B cell malignancies. It was then only in 2010 when uh, Hiroshi Handel's lab, using a, a drug affinity chromatography approach, has identified that the cellular binding partner of thalidomide is, is serapon, uh, a substrate receptor of, an, of the E3 ligase. It was then uh, two seminal studies, again coming out, of course, from the Faber, from uh, Bill Kalin's lab and Ebert's lab, and there was a, a third study from Raj Chopra from Selchin that then made the very fundamental next step uh, to uh, basically make sure that Thalidomide binding to serplon does not inhibit it, but diverts its function so that uh, serplon is endowed with the capability to degrade uh, proteins. In this case, most of the focus was on two zinc finger transcription factors, Icarus 1 and Icarus 3. Then through structural elucidation, it became clear how all of that is, how basically the molecular recognition uh, is taking place. Um, and these are, I wanna highlight two uh, studies here uh, from uh, Phil Chamberlain and colleagues and uh, from Georg Petzold in, in Nico Thomas lab that has really uh, taught us that the, the structural background that is required for the new substrate recognition is a better hairpin loop in a C2H2 sink finger. Uh, and why I'm mentioning that here is that this really set the stage for uh, also one of my favorite papers, yet another Ebert uh, Tome co-production that then took that understanding of the structural background and explored it very broadly, now leading to the understanding that many more of the proteins that harbor these zinc finger transcription factors might be within the range of being degraded by chemical modulation of serplon. In other words, where we, we thought you know, six years ago that what these molecules are doing is degrading Icarus 1 and Icarus 3, we now know that if we tweak the chemistry of these molecules, we might be able to degrade a substantially larger uh, population of these uh, zinc finger containing proteins. And notably, I think there's around 800 proteins uh, that encode or that harbor uh, C2H2 zinc fingers. So to me, one of the interesting questions is now, if we now accept uh, this as, as a truth uh, that we can degrade novel zinc finger transcription factors, I think what is very meaningful is now to innovate assays that really allow us to very quickly prioritize or earmark small molecules that are doing something unique in a cerebral dependent manner. Simply for the mean, uh, for the mere uh, focus to find molecules that, that really take new steps towards degrading uh, zinc finger containing proteins that are so far outside uh, of the reach of, of cerebral modulators. <clears throat> 
Um, and one way that we are addressing this in the lab is that we um, teamed up with uh, Greg Vladimir and his team at, at Allside, uh, who is a biotech, which is a biotech uh, company here in Vienna that has really mastered uh, the art of running uh, phenotypic assays with a single cell resolution in primary patient material. So in our coll collaboration with them, we took uh, a liquid manifestation from an ovarian cancer sample. So we, we did these kind of screens in 10 different uh, patient samples. Um, and so what that allows us to basically, we, what we have from each patient is a heterogeneous uh, mixture of malignant cells. So we have ovarian cancer cells, but we also have healthy cells. We have fibroblasts and K cells and T cells. And we can now expose each potential uh, cerebral uh, modulator. And we screened uh, a small library of around hundred uh, compounds to this, um, to this heterogeneous cell pool. Uh, and the first question that we can ask do we slow down the proliferation of the ovarian cancer cells? Uh, and kind of the 1B question that we can ask is, do we do that specific for the ovarian cancer cells over uh, the healthy cells? Uh, and that ex that's exactly what we did. And what you see here for a smaller uh, section of the molecules that we have profiled. Um, what was interesting for us to see is that non emits such as pomalidomide or lenalidomide were really quiet in that assay. So we didn't trigger anything uh, meaningful. What was also interesting to see is that uh, a molecule called CC885, which is also a known uh, cerebral modulator that uh, induces the degradation of different uh, zinc finger transcription factors, uh, but also I think most strongly of a, trans of a zinc finger uh, containing protein called uh, GSPT1 uh, involved in uh, uh, translation elongation. That was really on the side where you don't wanna be, uh, killing uh, healthy cells as strongly, if not stronger, uh, than the cancer cells. Uh, we got more interested by molecules that were on the other end of that scale, and particularly one uh, small molecule that appears to have uh, a quite pronounced uh, effect that was reporting on a specific ovarian cancer uh, 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 killing effect. Of course, at that point, it's also fair to mention that we don't know whether the effect of the small molecule on the ovarian cancer cell is a direct one, or whether this uh, involves any of these immune components or, or even the stromal cells. So in terms of a target identification, we are not in an easy position, right? Because what we would typically do is what I've shown you with the cyclin K degraders. You, you take the cell line that you're interested in and you do expression proteomics and you see what are the proteins that are destabilized. Um, here, we can't do that because A, we have limited availability of that material and B, it's this heterogeneous uh, mixture. So we don't know whether we would have to start in the ovarian cancer cell or in the T cells or in the NK cells. And so this is why we really also adopted uh, and implemented uh, this very clever trick that is reported uh, in the same paper that I've introduced uh, previously, where based on the notion that the zinc finger is really the structural degradation that is required for near substrate recognition, uh, what this guy, what uh, Sivers et al. did is to clone all uh, more than 6,000 uh, uh, unique zinc fingers in uh, these synthetic stability reporters, coupling it to GFP separated by RS from MGRE. And what you can then do is you can trans, uh, transfect uh, cell, cells of interest, 293Ts, for instance, with this um, library and couple drug treatment to FUC sorting to then find. Um, destabilize zinc fingers by uh, easy sequencing approach. And so for us, this is so useful here because it kind of uncouples uh, drug mechanism from these different cell types. We are operating this basically in a cell agnostic manner. And so for us, the first step was basically just to show that we are capable of running these screens uh, and our pomalidomide control was uh, destabilizing exactly the, the proteins that we would hope it would destabilize based on the literature and based, of course, on the Sievers et al. paper. When we were profiling the molecule uh, that we uh, fell in love with, um, we were particularly excited about the fact that there's uh, around six to 10 different zinc finger transcription factors that appear to be destabilized that have not been reported to be quote unquote degradable by uh, cerebral modulation so far. We also, of course, degrade some of the ones that are known to be within the reach of cerebral modulation. But it's also good to see that there's some of these uh, zinc finger transcription factors that are known to be degradable are not affected by our molecule, making sure that our molecule is not just a broad destabilizer of everything. 
This is something that we're currently validating and I can't share more with you because all of that is data that is very recent and we're currently at the stage where we're basically leveraging or taking the knowledge from the Sync Finger Stability Reporter and seeing which of those uh, events really validate uh, on, a, on a whole protein level. Uh, however, I wanted to share that with you because I think that this combination of running phenotypic screens with the single cell resolution coupled to this cell agnostic, um, very elegant stability reporter essay is something that is very powerful and uh, it's something that we are very excited about. I uh, hope we will be able to really delineate the mechanism of how this uh, compound can induce the degradation or can um, kill or reduce the prol proliferation of ovarian cancer cells. Um, and I'm looking forward to sharing that uh, with you and the community, hopefully uh, in the nearer future. Uh, so in sum, uh, I think I've shown you three different parts uh, or three different uh, stories that we have um, had going on or that we have going on in the, in the lab. Um, I've shown you that with a DTEC approach and acute degradation, we have a very good grasp on trying to understand first order mechanisms and really have a hold on a technology that allows us to validate therapeutic hypotheses. And we employed that to study human mediator. I've shown you how we have identified uh, the cycling K degraders uh, via this hypermetallated profiling approach. And I've shown you how we're using uh, more advanced phenotypic screens to find new cerebral modulators. I wanna leave you with a notion that I think that this idea of, of endowing proteins with a new functionality uh, using these you know, chemical neomorphs uh, is something that by no means uh, will or should be limited to targeted protein degradation. Um, and uh, th this is something that I'm, I'm also very excited of um, employing further, trying to find novel ways of how we can stabilize protein-protein interactions to derive an orthogonal function. So very importantly, in the end, I want to acknowledge people who, who actually did the work uh, and also people who paid for the work. Um, so I've shown you work from um, Martin, a PhD student on the mediator complex, uh, Christina uh, on uh, the uh, genetic determinants and also the molecular glue degraders, Matthias, who was also instrumental in developing most of these uh, approaches in the lab, uh, and then Sophie, Jose, uh, and, and Hannah are uh, involved in, these, in the identification of these novel cerebral modulators. Alex is involved in the project that I wanted to show, but that I can't due to time reasons. I want to acknowledge our collaborators and funding sources and everyone else in the lab. Uh, and with that, I hope that I'm in time and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>